This is the next to the last lecture from chapter 13, and this particular lecture will be about something called the Arrhenius Law, and it's a very conceptual lecture, and it'll explain where the rate constant small k comes from, and just about the theory of kinetics in general. So the theory that you need to um, be familiar with for kinetics is called the collision theory. And the most important thing that thing that says is that in order for molecules to react, they must collide with each other. Um, you don't really need to know that. It's just a matter of interest. And in not just any old collision will result in a reaction. The collision has to meet two criteria. Number one, the collision has to have enough energy when it collides in order to break the existing bonds that are present in the reactants, and the reactant molecules must collide in the proper orientation. So I've got um, diagrams on the next page to kind of show that. So this is all important kind of multiple choice questions to understand. So the first criterion, um, in other words, that molecules must collide before they can react, um, and they must have sufficient energy. So if they don't have sufficient energy, it's called an ineffective collision. And the reason they need the energy is they need to be able to get over, and I think you've probably all heard of activation energy, but activation energy is the energy that reactants are, all reactants in every single reaction need an activation energy. It's a little hill of energy they have to get over in order to react. Now, they may then in turn get all that energy back and some more, depending on the ultimate energy of the products, but they all do need some initial little spurt of energy to get going. And so if two molecules do not collide with adequate energy, you can think of them as falling back down this hill and not reacting. So the abbreviation for active energy is E sub A, and... Something called the activated complex, which is at the very tippy top of the activation energy hill, is the highest energy species that occurs during a reaction. So an occlusion must also occur with the correct orientation. Let's just look at this reaction as an example. Um, you can see that each of the reactants has a chlorine atom and that ultimately those two chlorine atoms need to get together, form a bond between them, and make molecular chlorine. And so these two reactant molecules must collide in a way that allows the two chlorine atoms to form a bond with each other. So if you look at the different orientations at the bottom of the page, the only one that leads to an effective collision is one where the two molecules collide such that the chlorine atoms can form a new bond. So orientation is in. Again, if both the energy requirements and orientation requirements are met, it's called an effective collision. The higher the frequency of effective collisions, the faster the reaction rate. So the mathematics that go along with the collision theory were developed by somebody called Arrhenius. And here is his mathematical equation. This is where the rate constant lowercase k, and it is really important that you use a lowercase k because the next chapter, equilibrium, is uh, uses an uppercase k. So anyway, what does the rate constant depend on? It's a constant, so it pretty much does stay constant unless you change the temperature of the reaction or the activation energy of the reactant. So rate constant depends on activation energy and temperature. You don't really have to worry so much about the other factors. We're not going to go into too much detail with them in this chapter. All right, so let's look at the effect of temperature on the rate constant. As you might expect, a higher temperature results in a larger rate constant. So rate constants are really only constant at a particular temperature. <clears throat> so you can conceptually, I'm sure, realize why a high, higher temperature would result in 
a larger K value because at a higher temperature, all of the molecules contain higher kinetic energy. Therefore, not only are there going to be more collisions because they're going to be dancing around faster, but there are also going to be more effective collisions. If the molecules have higher energy, the chance that they can get over that activation energy hump are much better. This graph is one that you've got to be able to interpret. And honestly, I still remember learning this graph. And when I initially learned it, it was very difficult for me to get wrap my head around it. And I think the reason is, is because energy is on the x-axis in this graph, and it's almost always on the y-axis, so it just feels backward to me. But let's set an activation energy for a particular molecule, okay? We'll arbitrarily set it there. And along the y-axis in this type of Arrhenius plot um, is the fraction of molecules. Essentially, think of it as the number of molecules. So the number of molecules in a reaction that have enough energy to surpass the needed activation energy. Um, so let's look at the lower temperature first, T1, the blue curve. The number of molecules that have the enough, act, enough energy to get over that activation hill are represented by what I just shaded in. At a higher temperature, the fraction, the Arrhenius plot spreads out, flattens out and spreads out. And as you can see, as a result of that, the fraction of molecules at a higher temperature that have enough energy to get over the activation energy hill are much larger. Okay. So you have a higher fraction of molecules that have enough energy to get over the activation energy at a higher temperature. Just be able to interpret that graph. So if you need to turn off my motor mouth for a minute and look at the graph, make sure you understand it, please. All right, so playing with the Arrhenius equation, because if you're like me, if you look at stuff in exponential form, it's not as intuitive as perhaps um, in the form of a line or some other proportional line, proportional relationship. So if you take the natural log of both sides of this, we can get rid of the exponent, right? And so it ends up looking like this. Um, and now I'm hoping that you can see this form of the Arrhenius equation and see that it's in the form of a line where on the y-axis, we would have natural log of the rate constant. I really should have put natural log of A over here because it's the intercept. The um, slope, in other words, m in the linear equation, the slope is okay, minus activation energy over r. And then, of course, the x value would be 1 over temperature. Um, let me make a really big deal at this point. Temperature must be Kelvin in this. Okay. All right, so let's look at a sample plot of natural log of the rate constant versus 1 over temperature. And the slope, remember what the slope is going to be. The slope of these lines is equal to minus activation energy divided by R. R is the gas constant. That shows up in so many equations in chemistry just randomly. It's a really important proportionality constant. Anyway, so that's what the slope is. So if you look at the line that has a rather large slope versus a line that has the more the smaller or shallower slope, um, that is due to differences in activation energy. The higher the activation energy, okay, the larger the slope. They're directly proportional. Activation energy and the slope of the Arrhenius graph are directly proportional. And um, conversely, the smaller the activation energy, the smaller the slope or the Arrhenius plot. All right, so you, um, you are going to need to be able to interpret graphs. You're also going to need to be able to plug and chug in the Arrhenius equation. And um, uh, when you do that, yeah, this is worth mentioning, that the universal gas constant, R, of course, if you look in any table of R values, they have all sorts of different R values depending on the units that you need. 
So as always, when selecting the correct R value to use, make sure you get units that match the rest of your values. Okay. Now, since we have an energy term in this equation, energy almost always has units of joules. All right. So make sure that you select the R value that has joules in it, and that happens to be 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. So make sure you use that value of R. I really probably shouldn't have put this in um, because you're not going to, I'm not ever going to make, ask you to actually generate an Arrhenius graph. You're just going to have to be able to interpret. But if you were to be given um, a variety of rate constants and temperatures and asked to draw an Arrhenius graph, guess what? You could. You would just take the natural log of the rate constant. You would convert your temperatures to Kelvin and take one over and voila, you could make a graph. Um, now, what you do need to be able to do is what we've done from this graph. I could give you a plot, and I probably will, an Arrhenius type plot, natural log of K over 1 over T, and ask you what the activation energy is for the, the reaction represented. How would you do that? Well, first you would determine the slope of this graph. So if you're actually given the data, you could use the data. Well, it's better to use the line. So what is the slope of anything? It is, okay, change in Y over change in X. And if you do that, you're going to have some variation, but you're basically going to come up with a slope about equal to 1.3, whoopsie daisy, to 1.37 times 10 to the fourth. Um, and so what do you do with that when you have a slope? Well, you plug it into the equation. You know that in an Arrhenius plot, slope equals minus activation energy divided by the gas constant. So when you rearrange that to solve for activation energy, you basically, let's just do it. So that means the activation energy equals, let's see minus slope times r. And what I all I did is multiply both sides of this equation by r. Okay, and then these cancel. All right, so then plugging in the values for slope, which we just found from the graph, times the r value. Um, 8.314 in joules, you get that the activation energy is 1.14 times 10 to the fifth joules. All right, so another form of the Arrhenius equation can you don't even need a graph for. But if you're reading a problem and it gives you two values of everything, okay, so two values of the rate constant, two values of the temperature, they are wanting you to use this form of the Arrhenius equation. I will give you this formula on the test because it's complicated enough. I don't want you to waste any of your time memorizing it. But I do want you to, to be very careful to look at it for a minute now because a lot of mistakes are made here. So you've got to make sure you match up the right rate constant with the temperature that goes along with it. Okay. So notice, for example, rate constant 1, if it's on the numerator of your y-axis, then the temperature that goes with it, so if it's first, then the temperature that goes with it is second. Just make sure you match these up. I'm not explaining this very well, or that you'll get the totally the wrong answer. So here's an example of that. I would recommend at this point, because there are all sorts of little, just trivial little math traps you can fall into here, um, including using the right units, doing the right order, etc. So I would um, recommend turning this video off for a minute and plugging in and making sure that you can get the right answer. And then I'll go over the answer on the next slide. When you are working with this form of the Arrhenius equation where you have two different temperatures and two different rate constants, be careful because there are
two commonly used forms of this equation. Both of them will give you the right answer, but I don't want it to mess you up. So you can either have the form I've shown here, or you can have a form that looks like this. Okay, and so the bottom line is pay attention to, I will, I will give you this on the test, um, but pay attention to the form that you're using because one of them has the rate constant 1 on top, the other has a rate constant 2, and depending on which one you have on top determines whether or not you have a plus sign in front of the activation energy or a minus sign. So all of the work I did down here, I used this form of the equation because I copied and pasted it um, from the book PowerPoint, but the form that I'm used to using is here with the negative sign. So that's what's going on down here. But prove to yourself that you can use either one of these forms, and you do, in fact, get the right answer regardless of the ones you used, which is right here. All right. Um, so anyway, you just, just practice with that. It's not a big deal. There are just a lot of little places where you can make minor math errors. The last slide, the Arrhenius equation, is kind of the meat and potatoes in this lecture. The rest of it is relatively simple and conceptual. It's important to understand what a catalyst does. I think we all know that catalyst will speed up a reaction without being used up itself. But you may not know how it speeds up a reaction. What a catalyst does is it actually lowers the activation energy, okay? And by doing so, makes it easier for molecules, reacting molecules, to get over that um, energy hump, activation energy hump in the beginning. There are different types of catalysts. These are just some definitions you should be familiar with. Homogeneous catalysts, as it sounds, are catalysts that are in the same phase <clears throat> as the reaction itself, so you can't, by looking at the reaction mixture, see that there's anything there. Heterogeneous cal catalysts are in different phases. Um, actually, a catalytic converter in your automobile is exactly what it sounds like. It's um, a metal, um, oh, I guess ceramic now. I'm just reading that. Um, but it's a solid catalyst um, that catalyzes cleaning up your exhaust emissions before they're emitted into the air. But you can obviously open up your catalytic converter and see that there are two different phases. There's the solid catalyst, and then there are the gases that are going through in a completely different phase. All right, so... Um, a heterogeneous catalysis is almost always using some type of solid material that attracts the reactants. And what happens is, remember, we have to have collisions in order for a reaction to occur. Well, these reactants may not collide with each other very often on their own, but if you introduce a solid catalyst that they're all attracted to, they start moving down and kind of associating with the solid catalyst. And because they're all associated with the same catalyst, they're closer together and they're more likely to collide. So that's how the solid catalyst works. And then my final slide is just to have you realize that almost all biological reactions that occur in our bodies are catalyzed. And so biological catalysts are called enzymes, and they're typically some type of protein. Um, and so look at this. I thought this was fascinating. An enzyme can increase the rate of reaction that goes on in your body by as much as, I don't even know what that number is, 14 zeros, by that much of a factor. So apparently without our enzymes, <clears throat> our body is not going to function. Um, and that's it for now. So uh, you have one more lecture from Chapter 13, and it is called Mechanisms of Reaction. And then we're on to Chapter 14, Equilibrium.